Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Going to Bat with Team Irie. This is episode number 31. Uh, if you have uh, missed some of the other episodes, you can scroll down here on the foundation page and kind of look at those, uh, the other 30. Or if you want to keep an eye on our upcoming episodes, you can do that by keeping an eye here on the foundation page. And we usually post that the day of or the day before who we're going to have on. Also, if you'd like to do any of our public events that we do for fundraising, uh, you can keep an eye on that and also donate to our calls, which is raising money for spinal cord injury research in baseball, high school, softball, and, of course, baseball scholarships. You can do that by going to our website, which is dif35.org. Tonight's guest is none other than Willie Blair. Thanks for being on here tonight, Willie. How are you doing? I'm doing great, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we really appreciate you coming on here. It's it's always an honor to talk to uh, former Major League Baseball players and uh, being from Easter, Kentucky. I mean, it's really an honor to have somebody on here that from the 606, as we like to call it, uh, Painesville native, played at Moorhead State. Uh, growing up, just like a lot of us, was it always a dream for you to go to the Major Leagues and play baseball even at a young age? It, yeah, I was. I, I knew from a young age that uh, that's what I wanted to do. Um, <clears throat> and we were lucky enough in Paintsville to have um, a team in the Appalachian League. We had originally there was, a, I think, a, a co-op team called the Paintsville Highlanders, maybe started in 1978. And then um, they had the Paintsville Yankees and, and later on it became the Paintsville Brewers. So we had a pro team there for, uh, I don't know, seven or eight years, uh, or maybe a little bit longer. But uh, I remember going to those games when I was 13 years old and just thinking I was watching big league players. And really, they were kids that were college age or, or just out of college. And um, But what I was lucky enough, to, you know, being lucky enough to see that, it, it made me realize when I got up to be – 16, 17 years old, I was like, I can play with those guys. And uh, that's when I kind of really realized that I could possibly, you know, play baseball as a career. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And also, uh, you know, other kids that, uh, you know, have the same dream as we had growing up, what advice would you give them if they came up to you and say, you know, said something about wanting to play in the major leagues? What would your advice be? even at kids as a, at an early age? I think the biggest advice or best advice I could give is don't ever let anybody tell you that you can't do something. Um, I, you know, always played kind of with a chip on my shoulder uh, in some ways because, you know, you always hear, you know, you're from Eastern Kentucky, nobody's going to see you, you don't have a chance all this stuff. And I wanted to prove everybody wrong. And uh, as much as I love the game, I also wanted to prove pe to people that a, a guy from Eastern Kentucky could do what anybody else could do. So that was uh, kind of a motivation for me. Exactly. Which is a good one. Uh, I know you went to, uh, of course, played at Paintsville and went to Moorhead State and played over there. Uh, were you recruited by Moorhead State and, uh, and did you play when you were over there for Steve Hamilton? Oh, I did. I, I want to correct one thing. You said I played for Paintsville. I played for Johnson Central. There you I, go. I can't, I can't let that go. <laughs> there you yeah, go. Uh, Coach Hamilton actually did, was one of the few college coaches that did recruit me. He came to um, – actually came to a camp that was put on by the Paintsville Yanks. Um, and so, um, he came there, he saw me at that camp and got interested in me and, um, just followed me for the next year or two. And, and, um, like I said, I mean, there was a, a few, um, there was a few schools, small schools that, that, uh, recruited me, but he was the main guy. And, and, uh, so, yeah, he was – my experience at Moorhead was great. I, I, I learned a lot from Coach Hamilton. Uh, I probably learned more about the psychological part of the game, more so than actual uh, 
pitches, you know, or anything like that. My stuff was pretty much the same uh, when I left there as when I got there. It was refined a lot. You know, I learned how to throw strikes a lot better and, and uh, maybe learned a little bit more about how to set up hitters and that kind of thing. But he really taught me more about, you know, the, um, you know, how to stay on an even keel, uh, you know, how to compete on every pitch, you know, is all the psychological things uh, was probably, you know, what I took more from him more so than, than, than actually pitch mechanics or, or something like that. But I learned a lot from him. He was a great man and, and definitely, uh, uh, you know, missed him. Uh, I realized after I left there what I had, you know, and definitely missed him when he passed away. Yes, and my uncle Bob was asking if uh, he taught you the ethos pitch, which you called the uh, the folly floater. Yeah, he. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I really didn't know the significance of that until I got to Moorhead, and and I there was a picture that he had in his office. Uh, of him throwing a pitch and the ball's up in the air. And, uh, you know, so, you know, obviously we started uh, trying to figure out what it was. And so he, he would actually throw it during batting practice on the, on the, uh, uh, the last pitch to each hitter. You know, they'd throw their – they'd get their, you know, three rounds of hitting in. And then on the last pitch he would throw it. And he just basically kind of stopped in the middle of his motion and lobbed the ball. Uh, in there and he could actually get it into the hitting zone with the batting cage around him, you know, around the hitter. I don't know how he did that. He'd mm -hmm. throw that thing, you know, 15 feet up in the air and it would come straight down into the hitting zone. That, that was pretty fun. So that, the one story I could tell you about that uh, is um, I, I cannot remember the major league hitter, but he had gotten this hitter out with this pitch before. And, uh, the, as the story goes, uh, that player told his teammates that if he gets me out with that again, I'm going to crawl back to the dugout. And sure enough, he threw it to him again and got him out. He popped up, if I'm not mistaken, to third base or the catcher or something. And for about the last 10 feet or so, he crawled back into the dugout. So that was uh, – I, I have seen that, though. I can't remember the name of the player, though. That that's a pretty good story right there, and of course everybody loves stories, uh, you know, especially when it comes to Major League Baseball players and and their lives. Uh, my uncle also was wanting to know if you uh, if you played on the same staff with uh, Walt Terrell and did, and did Drew Hall go there? Um, did not play with uh, Walt Terrell. He was uh several years older than me i don't know maybe six or seven years older than me maybe uh so we missed each other there but we did play against each other in the big leagues uh, gotcha. for a few years uh drew hall was a teammate of mine there but drew was also two years older than me i believe uh or two years in school ahead of me so uh i i did play with him for a couple of years or actually i only played with drew for one year i played when my freshman year he was there but uh, okay. Drew was uh, he was uh, he was tough in college. He was he was really uh, had talent you didn't really see. I mean, he was a left-hander that I, I saw up to ninety-seven miles an hour, wow. uh, which was really kind of uh, rare back then. You know, now everybody throws that hard. But uh, he, um, I think, if I remember correctly, he was the number three pick overall in the draft that year and that may be 84. So, um, heck of a pitcher for sure. Exactly. And, and, you know, I've heard some stories about how good he was too. And, uh, you know, playing at Moorhead state being a smaller college and playing there. And, uh, and do you think that it matters like where you play like a smaller college, even at Moorhead state, cause you're an example that you can still be drafted from someplace like Moorhead. <clears throat> even a smaller college, but do you think that makes a difference where you play at college ball? You know what? I, I think if you are a good player and you put up good numbers and, and, and that kind of thing, uh, they will find you. Now, does it hurt you at all? I mean, a little bit, you, you're not going to get the, 
early looks like, uh, you know, some of the big SEC schools and, you know, the Pac-10 schools and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but they will find you. And, you know, their phones ring, the scouts' phones ring all the time. When, uh, one of them say, come and I got this player, come see him, you know. So they will find you. And, and you know, does, does it matter a little bit? Yes. Does it really matter in the end? Probably not. Great advice there. I really like that. Um, you know, going through the minor league system, we're working up to the major leagues, but going through the minor league system, you know, I've heard some people say they ran into challenges and it took them a little while to get through there and different things. But did you make it through the minor leagues pretty quickly to make it to the majors, what you would consider on schedule? I was, I was pretty much on schedule. Uh, you know, I played – uh, rookie ball the first year, then uh, A ball, double A and triple A the next year. And then, and then, um, so I just basically jumped a step each year. And then fortunately, after I got through that triple A year, um, fortunately and unfortunately, uh, that year we had a, in 1990, we had a lockout to begin the season. Um, and so spring training started a little bit late. Uh, and I went, just, you know, with the big league club and spring training and, and ended up having a really good spring training. Uh, I actually, I don't even know if I gave up a run, maybe one, maybe one run in spring training. But um, that year, because of the lockout, they expanded the rock by three uh, for the first month. Well, fortunately, because of the spring training that I had, I made the team out of spring training. And, um, and, and so, you know, I think that's, was the determining part of the factor, you know, that they expanded the roster. So, um, I, I pitched well, but, uh, that, that expanded roster was a big, big help to me to get to the big leagues. Um, now what ended up happening, you know, at the end of that first month, we were supposed to cut the rosters back down. And because I pitched so well that first month, I ended up st sticking. I ended up staying there almost all year that year. I think I, I did get optioned down for about three weeks in uh, in August when they, you know, had to make a roster move. So, um, so that was that was a great experience. And and so I, I you know, to answer your question uh, is yeah, I, I pretty much just took one step each year. And after I got there, though, as you always hear. Uh, getting there is easier than staying there. So after I got there, the next couple of years, I bounced back and forth and tripped away to, uh, to the big leagues a couple, you know, several times. Uh, and then finally in 1992, uh, when I got called up in uh, maybe May or in June, I guess, I, I was able to stick in the big leagues from that point on until um, until like, I, I guess it was 92 through 2000. And then in 2001, I ended up having to go back to Tripway for a little bit uh, before I went back to the big league. So it's a, uh, it's a lot easier to get there than it is to stay there. Yeah, exactly. But you stayed there for a while. So, I mean, you've done a lot better than the rest of us. Uh, I've got, I don't know if you can <laughs> see the, the comments on the side there or not, but, <clears throat> But Tom Posey says, hello from Maysville. He's a Cub scout. He says, go Cubs. Kevin Gray, the Beachwood uh, varsity baseball coach, he, he wants to know who's the toughest player to pitch to and for you to get out. The toughest one? No no question. Barry Bonds. Uh, Barry Bonds was the most talented hitter um, that I've ever seen. I, I, I would venture to say – that he's the most talented hitter ever. Um, he did things that um, you, you just can't explain. I mean, I mean, obviously uh, he had power, and, and uh, but he hit for average. Um, he took his walks, um, but he had this crazy sense that you, if you got him out one way. You know, I, I remember this, you know, I remember this plain as day. I struck him out once time, one time with a, uh, 
a back foot slider. You know, I got him. I threw a slider right towards his back foot. He swung right over top of it for strike three. It's only, I think it's the only time I've ever struck him out. But it, I, he would never swing at that pitch again for the rest of the, my career. Next time, for the rest of the time I faced him, he oh. never swung at that pitch again. And and he was just he could he could see it and he recognized it and just lay off of it from that point on. It, it, he was he was incredible. Did you ever face Tony Gwynn? I did. Uh, actually, uh, I faced him and played with him for two years, but, uh, I actually pitched well against him. I think I, if I'm not mistaken, I think he was like four for four for 17, four for 18, something like that. So I, I got him out a little bit and I actually, I actually struck him out one time too, which is a rare feat to strike yeah. him out. Yes. I've been reading some up on him and which of course I remember him playing, but it's just crazy how he didn't really strike out. <laughs> yeah. And he, he, I'll tell you what, he was a great teammate too. Uh, when I played with him, uh, obviously when you play against him, he's tough, but uh, when you play with him to see him, like when I was playing with him, he had uh, a lot of foot problems and uh, knee problems and stuff, but that dude would find a way to go out on that field and play and, and no matter what, he was going to go out and get him a hit or two every day. It was incredible. Yeah, I was always a big Tony Gwynn fan. Of course, Nolan Ryan fan. Al Oliver was on the other night. He said it took him four years to get to the majors, too. So I was just thinking about your process of going to the majors. Al even told him me that that was how long it took him to get to the majors also. And uh, uh, John Holder over here, he says, love the new background. Looking good, fellas. He's from Vanceburg here. And. Brandon Walker, my nephews of Go Eagles. Mike Long uh, from Estill County down there. He wanted to know, was Drew Hall also from Johnson County? No, he was from uh, Boyd County, but he, he went to school at Ashland Paul Blazer, I believe. Exactly. I, 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 yeah, I remember he was from up in this area. And and Kevin Gray wanted to know this, which I don't know if you want to you know, comment on this, but he said, in your opinion, should Brady Bonds be in the Hall of Fame? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I know in that era, uh, there were, you know, the, the steroid era and all that. And, you know, he wasn't the only one doing it. And I would, uh, probably, I would say that there are probably people in the hall of fame already that were probably steroid users. Uh, and I think to single out, him and Mark McGuire and Sammy Sosa and, and guys and Roger Clemens and, and to single those guys out and say, no, you guys can't get in. I think is probably not the best way to handle that. Um, now, do I condone what, what happened during that era? No, I don't. But uh, what I've done is I've, I've accepted that that was a part of the game and, um, there were many others that were doing that kind of stuff um, and have benefited from it. Um, but I've just accepted that it's part of the game. So Barry Bonds, with or without steroids, was the best player that I've ever seen. That's a good answer. And and uh, Kevin Gray says, I agree. Now, you know, Ben from Eastern Kentucky and – I know it wouldn't be any different from being from anywhere else, but to us it's special because we're from the 606 area. And of course we love <coughs> Eastern Kentucky, but you know, a lot of the players I've talked to described getting that call up to the majors. What was it like when you got that call that you were going to the majors? Well, mine was kind of strange actually, because, uh, you know, like I said, I, I made the team out of spring training. Um, and at the end of spring training, nobody said a word to me. Nobody said, hey, you made the team. So we were going from um, spring training to Texas, and we had like a day off before the season started, and we were going to open up the season there against the Rangers. So there was still two or three extra guys so, so they expanded the roster to 27, I believe, that year. 
because I think at that time we only had 24 man rosters, but they expanded it to 27. But we still had like 29 or 30 guys that went to Texas on, on the team flight. So we had a workout that next day and we're all going there and all, you know, all those young guys that were thinking, well, why haven't they told us yet that either we're on the team or we're going to AAA? And uh, so we get to the ballpark and still nobody said a word to me. Nobody said a word. <laughs> You're on the team, nothing. So um, <laughs> get back to the hotel and, a couple of my buddies come up and say, Hey man, congratulations. You made the team. They, they just told me I I'm going back to triple a, I get to the ballpark the next day and they still haven't told me I made the team, but uh, there's a uniform in my locker. So I just assumed that I made the team. So, <laughs> so nobody really said anything. <laughs> that, that's pretty good. I, that's a different story than most guys have told me. So you've got a unique story there. Uh, you know, you played in, you know, 12 years or so in, in a major in eight different, eight different teams. Uh, was there a certain team you enjoyed playing for more than any other? And if so, why? And my uncle also wanted to know if uh, you kept the uniforms that they were issued from each team and you, do you have them hang them on your wall? Okay. Uh, as far as the uniforms, uh, I, I kept a lot of them. I'm not sure if I was able to get out of there with all of them, but I kept several and they're not on the wall yet. I got them uh, packed in a, in a, in a box. At some point they're going to be on the wall. Uh, I got most of them, not all of them, but uh, as far as the teams, the favorites, um, I think every team that I played for, I had some special memories uh, there. Um, you know, you talk about Colorado uh, with being the first, you know, first team in Colorado. That was pretty special just because of the guys there. We were all guys that came from every organization. Um, that was, I had some really good friends there. Um, I had a, in 1996 and with the Padres, that was the only time in my 12 year career that we made the playoffs. That was a special team. We had a really good team. Um, I had the one really good year in Detroit in 97. Um, mm -hmm. and our team was okay. I mean, we were probably two or three players away from being a pretty good team. I think we finished four games under, under 500, uh, with a couple of breaks here and there, we could have been, you know, a, a team that, you know, four or five, four, you know, four or five games over 500, um, that team was pretty special because we were young and, and uh, scrappy. And, and a lot of us were, were just starting to learn how to be just starting to learn how to be good big league players. Um, so probably my favorite, that was probably my favorite three teams, you know, the 93, 94 Rockies, um, you know, 95, 96 Padres, 97 Tigers. Um, but again, you know, I had great memories and, and, and the other places too. Um, those three teams probably stood out a little bit more. Something else that I didn't realize till I started doing my due diligence on you before I interviewed you, but, uh, you know, you were part of a kind of a notable trade there. Uh, you know, it was you and Eddie Thomasy that played a little bit for the Reds and got traded for Kenny Lofton and, and Dave Rode. That was you know, kind of a notable deal there for Cleveland when they got Kenny Lofton. Yeah, it was. Um, you know, Kenny Lofton ended up being a really good player uh, in his big league career. Uh, I think when we got traded for each other, uh, I think all of us, um, I don't think any of us were, other than Kenny, were really prospects. I think we were more suspects uh, with Taubensy, me, and Rody. Uh, but Lofton was really fast. But when 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 that trade happened, he was still not a um, finished product. He he was fast. He struck out a lot. Um, he was very raw, but you could tell he's a very talented player. 
and he ended up being a heck of a player. He really did. Exactly. And and then, of course, you played, uh, you pitched for the Rockies. You talked a little bit about that the first year, you know, the expansion draft. That had to be kind of memorable. And I know you said that was memorable, but you played, you know, over there when they, they first created, you know, the Rockies. That had to be pretty fun being one of the first. It, it definitely was. And, uh, you know, playing in Mile High Stadium uh, the first couple of years uh, was, was, uh, that was a pretty uh, weird experience. Uh, you know, I'd never pitched in that type of altitude. Um, you know, but it it was it was it was neat that because the fans there were uh, starving for baseball, and uh, that's the only uh, major league team in that time zone, really, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but uh, the fans were incredible. They, we sold out every game. I remember on opening day in 93, the first game that they ever played there on opening day, we were out taking batting practice and they were still working on temporary bleachers in center field that were probably 75 feet up. I mean, I I'm like, they're still working on those. And today there's going to be probably a couple thousand people on those bleachers right there. And they're like 75 feet up and they're just now finishing them. You know, that, when did they have time to test them is what I want to know. But, uh, you know, that first game, I think if I'm not mistaken, we set the all time record uh, for uh, attendance for one game. And I think it was over 80,000 if I'm not mistaken. So, um, and like I said, we were sold out every game. It, it was crazy. I mean, that it, it, that was so much fun. Uh, we weren't a, we weren't a good team, but it was a, it was a lot of fun. You know, they always say it's not a pitcher friendly park because of the light air. So you didn't mind pitching there? <clears throat> hey, it, I was pitching in the big leagues. You know, was it? The same, it wasn't. And and were we at a disadvantage? Absolutely. Um, overall, as far as putting up numbers. Now, when teams came there, I felt like we had an advantage because we kind of learned how to adapt to that environment. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, that altitude, not only does it affect, you know, how the ball carries for hitters, it affects how it moves and how it breaks as a pitch, you know, from from a pitcher. Um, so your your breaking ball doesn't move as much, your sinker doesn't move as much. You know, you don't. It's everything kind of straightens out. So you really have to learn how to execute uh, pitches. Um, the other thing that people don't really talk about as much is is uh, the altitude really takes an effect on your body and how your body recovers from day to day and, and you have to stay hydrated and you have to take, really take care of yourself. And it took us a while to learn that, but after we did, I mean, we, we, I felt like we had the advantage. You know, those are some good points. I knew about the, uh, you know, the altitude on your body, but I never really thought about the altitude when it came to pitching and your breaking of the pitch and all that kind of stuff. So that's, that's something I didn't even realize. So those are some good points. So, uh, you know, you also in 97, you had a good year, of course. Uh, I think your best year, 15 and 8, when you was with the Detroit Tigers, which, of course, that was a good year. What do you attribute that year being, you know, the way it was and, and you doing so well pitching? Was there something, you know, that helped you along that year? Or is it just like just happened? I think uh, I think there was a lot of things went into that, to be honest with you. Um, you know, it was the first time that anybody – had given me an opportunity to be a full-time starter. Now, all throughout my career, I started and relieved, and I bounced back and forth from bullpen to starter, and I did that a lot and and was happy to do it. You know, I, that was one of my uh, strengths is my, um, you know, versatility. So um, I, I was happy to do that. But this particular year, they gave me a chance to make the team as a starter and, and – um, showed me that confidence and that helped me, uh, you know, to have that confidence myself. And, 
And uh, like we spoke earlier, I always pitched with a little bit of uh, attitude or, or chip on my shoulder. And I wanted to prove to everybody that I could do that. And um, so, you know, some other things that happened that year, though, that, that was a strange year because um, May 4th, May 4th of that year, I, I, I pitched okay up to that point. I think I was two and two or two and three or something, but I was a little bit inconsistent, you know, those first you know, five or six starts. Well, on May 4th, I got hit in the face with a line drive. Uh, Julio Franco hit a line drive back at me and hit me in my ear and jaw and uh, broke my jaw. And I ended up missing a full month of that season. And, um, you know, I, I, that night in the hospital, I ended up watching the video because it was on every news station playing over and over and over all day, you know. So I ended up seeing it while I was in the hospital that night. And I realized that I got very close to catching this ball, but I had a flaw in my delivery where I opened up my front side and I kind of, I was not in a very good defensive position at the end of my delivery. So I realized that and, and I was like, I got to do something to protect myself. So after I started healing up and I started getting back to throwing and, and that kind of thing, I really focused on a couple things to, you know, the main thing was to finish my delivery in a, in, in a position where I could defend myself. You know, if you watch Greg Maddox, he was always landed. He, he was a great fielder, but he would land and he would be the right there. He was ready to field a ground ball just like an infielder. Yeah. So I wanted to get to that, to that position. So I really changed a couple little things in my delivery that allowed me to land that way. I, I didn't do it every time, but I landed that way more consistently. So what I found was when I was getting myself in a, the proper position, you know, I, 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 my release point was more consistent. My release point was more consistent. So now my command, I could hit, you know, either side of the plate, I could elevate, I could throw the ball in the dirt. My command got better just because my release point got more consistent. So then you start factoring all those things in. You start being able to throw the ball where you want to more often. You start having more success. So uh, with that being said, and another thing that contributed to that, if I'm not mistaken, our defense that year was one of the top defensive teams in the league, you know, in Detroit. So – you know, getting an opportunity, making a, a mechanical adjustment, becoming more consistent with my command and having a really good defense. Um, and then one other thing that helped me is it seems like we scored a lot of runs when I pitched. So uh, we'd score a few runs early and I could kind of ease into the game and get comfortable. So all those things contributed to that year. Um, so, it wasn't just one thing. It wasn't just me learning how to pitch. It was, it was a culmination of all those things. Those are some great points, and especially about finishing, you know, when you're pitching. And, I mean, sounds like to me you need to be a pitching coach, but we'll get into that. We'll get into that after a <laughs> while. But uh, there's some more questions over here, and, I, you know, I better read them before they go away. Uh, Scott Ratliff says, Willie, this was – this was my childhood buddy, always played catch and with me when he and my brother played baseball together. So, you know, Scott Ratliff. I do. I, I, uh, I can't remember. Um, I remember the name. I can't remember um, exactly where I played catch with him at, but uh, I do remember that name for sure. It's okay, been you a got long time. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't spent much time back in Johnson County in a long time. There you go. And uh, Mike Long, uh, he wanted to know uh, what memory of pitching in Cincinnati stands out to you the most? What memory? Say it again. What memory of pitching in Cincinnati? Did you ever go to Cincinnati and pitch in Cincinnati in, in any with any of your teams? Yeah. I mean, I, just going there and, and, and playing uh, in front of family. I always had a lot of family there. Uh, that's what I remember the most. Um, 
you know, the other thing was playing against Barry Larkin. He, uh, for whatever reason, he was always one of my favorite players. And uh, I got to know him a little bit as, as um, you know, as competitors. Uh, but I always loved that he played the game. Uh, this guy's a Hall of Fame talent. But uh, if he hit a ground ball back to the pitcher, you needed to be ready because you, he was running down those baseline, down that baseline fat, and you needed to be ready to get rid of the ball. And that, I, I always respected him for that. I mean, he was like I said, he's a superstar uh, player, but he played the game the right way, and I just loved how he played the game. So, you know, playing against him, playing playing uh, in front of family, uh, I could always go home for one one day usually. Uh, when I, at that time I lived in Lexington, so, uh, I could, I could always run home for a day. And so that, that's pretty much what I remember. I, I do remember one story from there that it had nothing to do with me, but it was a funny story. Um, we had a pitcher, um, for the Astros. Um, I'm drawing a blank on his name right now, but, uh, <laughs> He, uh, he was a guy that was kind of cocky. He's a pretty good pitcher, uh, kind of cocky, uh, but he, he, he could get frustrated. And uh, in Cincinnati, that I'm not sure if they still do it or not. I, they used to. Every time one of the Cincinnati players hits a home run, those cannons go off, you know, so, so they shoot those cannons off. So uh, <clears throat> this pitcher gave up a couple of home runs, and the pitching coach goes out there, and he gets out there and, and – Pitcher goes, what the hell are you doing out here? What are you doing? You know, he goes, hey, man, I'm just I'm just coming out here. I'm trying to give that guy out there and that cannon time to reload. <laughs> <laughs> so that's one of the funniest stories that I know from Cincinnati. Yeah, yeah that's a good one. I know uh, Al Oliver was telling me a story about Cincinnati, and I guess you got to go through security when they were players back then. And something about Doc Ellis went down there and uh, – I don't know if he didn't have his ID with him or whatever, but the security, he ended up getting maced. So, you know, it could be bad. Yeah. So well, they, could, they always treated me great there. So uh, that was, that was awesome. And I remember the pitcher's name now is Mark Portugal was the pitcher. I remember Mark Portugal. I think he, uh, I think he pitched for the Reds a little bit. I think he did. I'm pretty sure he did. Yep, yeah, exactly. Uh, Brandon Walker, my nephew there, he was, uh, he just wanted to know that chip on your shoulder you were talking about. Where did that come from, or what do you attribute to to that? You know, to that chip. Is it just like you felt like that? You know, of course it was motivational, but what 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 do you attribute to having that chip on your shoulder? Well, uh, I, I I think it's just uh, I'm I, I'm very competitive. Uh, I've always been competitive. Uh, I think that was instilled in me at a young age. Um, you know, I, I played a lot of basketball. I had, I had a couple of coaches that were really tough on us and, and, and uh, uh, you know, made us be, um, you know, they, they, they kind of played that up. You know, when we went to play the big schools, they're like, hey, you're just from a small town in eastern Kentucky and, you know, we want to go to Lexington. We want to beat this team and, you know, play against these city boys. And, and you know, I think that's where it came from is, is I always wanted to prove that I was just as good as those guys that come from uh, big towns, big cities or big schools. Um, and I think that's where it came from. I, I, I you know, Coaches made us tough when we were, you know, younger, a lot tougher than kids are nowadays. Um, and we, I think we were exposed to a little more. Uh, we had to earn everything. And, and uh, I think nowadays, sometimes that's not the case. Um, so I, I, that's where it comes from, you know, just growing up and, and having coaches that were, um, you know, tough on us, but also, uh, loved on us when we needed it and, and uh, um, you know, just made us really tough competitors. Exactly. And, uh, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about 1999, which, you know, I'm 
I always loved the history of the game, but in 99, you started opening day at, uh, you know, at Detroit and you were actually the last opening day pitcher to start at uh, Detroit Tiger Stadium. I thought that was pretty neat. Yeah, that was, that was really neat. Uh, it wasn't opening day of the season. It was our, our home opener. So yeah. it was the home opener for Detroit, but, um, you know, I remember that day and, and, uh, you know, I understand the significance and the historic nature of, of, of that day, but I want to be a hundred percent honest. I did not enjoy that part of it as much as I would have liked to, because like I said, when I pitched, I was a competitor and, and, and I was focused and I was more focused on getting the Minnesota twins out that day than I was in all the stuff that was happening in, in, the, in my surroundings. So I, I didn't get the chance to enjoy it as much as I would have liked. Um, now, don't get me wrong. I had a job to do. That was my job. I, I, I appreciate that opportunity of pitching that day. And, and fortunately, I went out and pitched well. And, and um, you know, I, I think I, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I may have had a, a, a shutout for eight innings or maybe one run in eight innings. So I pitched really well. Um, so that was, that was enjoyable, but I did not, I wish I could have enjoyed all the other stuff and all the hoopla and, and all the stuff that was associated with that day. That's pretty good though. I mean, you were part of history there. So, I mean, that's something to remember just being a part of it is a pretty cool experience. Now, you know, a lot of the players we've had on here has told little clubhouse stories. Is there anything that you can kind of share with us about, you know, playing major league baseball that, uh, that happened. That's kind of funny. Uh, there's a couple, um, there's, you know, when I was coming up with the blue Jays, um, uh, you know, we, that, that team was more of a veteran team and a lot of those guys had played together all through the minor leagues. They came up from the time they were, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old and, and and had been playing together for many, many years through the minor leagues and, and for several years in the big leagues as well. Two guys that, uh, um, you know, really stood out was George Bell and uh, Tony Fernandez. They grew up in the same town in, in the Dominican, uh, but they grew up like, like brothers and, they fought like brothers sometimes. I mean, it was incredible. I mean, these are two big league players that, you know, and we'd have a couple of the other players over here and they were like, Hey, George, did you hear what Tony said? Tony did this and they would instigate it and they'd start off just playing. And next thing you know, they're full out slap fighting. I mean, it would, we'd have to pull them apart. And uh, so, you know, you get stuff like that. You get the instigators over in the corner get them going and then they start fighting and then all the guys over here laughing and then we have to pull them apart. So you got that kind of story. And then uh, I had another guy that I played with, uh, Greg Jeffries, who uh, was always um, kind of a prankster. You know, he would mess with people and all that stuff. So somebody, I can't remember who it was. I wouldn't tell you if I did remember who it was, but they, they uh, waited till the middle of the game, and it was getaway day. So we had to wear our coat and dress pants and all that. So they waited until he was out in the game, and they went and got his stuff and his pants and, and watered them up into uh, just a ball and stuck them in the freezer. So when he comes in, when he comes in, he's just got a, his pants are in a ball, in a frozen ball. So uh, – so the pranks, you know, the pranks are, that's, that's what I remember. The, the banter going back and forth, uh, you know, ragging each other about one thing or another, uh, all those things, you know, are great memories. Uh, a lot of them are probably not suited for, uh, some of those stories are probably not suited for this audience. So, uh, that's, I'll give you those and that I'll stop right there. <laughs> hey, those those are some good ones. I appreciate that. And we're about out of questions here, but uh, what was your most memorable moment 
in your major league career? I know you've said a few there, but if you had to pick one, what would be your most memorable moment? Uh, if I had to pick one, um, you and I spoke earlier about your favorite player and my favorite player was Nolan Ryan. Um, my first first day in the big leagues, first day with a big league uniform, uh, standing on third base line, um, was probably the most special day. Uh, you know, just being on that opening day roster, that was probably the biggest memory. But just so happened on that day, my childhood idol, Nolan Ryan, was pitching against us. Now I didn't pitch in that game, you know, and I I didn't I didn't uh, get an opportunity to. Uh, to even, you know, warm up or anything. So, but my childhood idol was pitching against my team and I got to watch him on opening day in my very first day in the big leagues. And he had a no hitter for five innings and, but they ended up taking him out for the, for a pitch count just because it's the first day of the season. So uh, that probably stands out more than anything, just because, that was my childhood dream. And, and, and I standing on third base line that day, I was like, Hey, I'm in the big leagues. This is what I've worked my entire life for. And I'm here and I get to watch that guy right there. Start today. I get to watch Nolan Ryan, who I grew up watching and loved it. And, and I got to watch him pitch that day. So that was the, that was probably the, the, the biggest one, biggest memory. I can totally relate to that. I mean, not being there, but I could, you know, kind of contemplate exactly what you're talking about because that would be a great moment. I'll finish up with some of these comments over here. Uh, Mike Long said, great comment about pitching mechanics and finishing. Bobby Sapp wanted to know, what was your favorite pitch against a big-named opponent? My favorite pitch? Uh, I, I probably, I was probably known more for my slider. Um, but to be perfectly honest, I was a guy that threw four pitches and my thought was, I want to throw what I need to get the hitter out. And it, so my favorite pitch was the one that got the hitter out, whether, whether it was a elevated fastball, whether it was a slider in the dirt, you know, whether it was a change up, you know, I, 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 I think it it varied from hitter to hitter, really. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, you've made some great, I mean, great uh, answers tonight to these questions. I love it. Um, Scott Radliff, he said, play for legendary coach Steve Hamilton at Moorhead State. We talked about that. Uh, he pitched for Yankees and others. Did he ever learn the Foley, fly, fo Foley floater from Coach Hamilton, which, you know, I, he missed that part when we started right there. And then uh, we talked about that earlier. And Brandon Walker, uh, he said, Brent, being raised in a holler with coaches that knew how to get the most out of the players. He's talking about, you know, Eastern Kentucky. And then Mike Long wanted to know, can you talk about one of your managers, uh, such as who was most influential on you? <clears throat> Golly, I, I played with some managers that I really, really liked and really respected. Um, my first manager in the big leagues was Cito Gaston. And uh, um, he made a point, you know, he's a veteran guy. He'd been around the big leagues for a long time. And, and he made a point to, to uh, make me feel comfortable and um, to basically show me that he had confidence in me. And uh, I remember um, one of the things that he, I remember a quote in, in the paper that he said about me, um, I, I had a little bit of a tough time as far I was pitching well, but I was getting some losses. And I, I think that at the time I was 0 and 5 in my rookie year. But like I said, I, I pitched pretty well. And I had a chance to come in for a couple of back to back days. I, I pitched one day. Uh, the first day I came in and got through one pitch to Cal Ripken, got a ground ball, got out of the inning. That was the eighth inning. We were down by one run. Uh, got a ground ball uh, to get out of the inning. We come in and we score two. So I'm out of the game, and they bring in the closer, bring in Tom Hinkie. 
So I got a win that day. I threw one pitch. Well, the very next day, he brings me in an exact same situation, but I'm facing Sam Horn, and I threw two pitches, got a ground ball to second, come out of the game. We score two. Same thing. I'm out of the game. Hinky comes in but uh, and gets the save. So I got two wins on back-to-back days on three pitches. So I, what I remember him saying about that game uh, was that uh, I had – uh, I had guts and that he was, he had no problems with putting me in a game like that and a close game like that. And he hoped that I got 10 more wins just like that. So, uh, so he, he meant a lot to me. Um, uh, D- uh, Don Baylor was the same way. Um, he, he really um, went out of his way to treat players uh, the right way Um and I had a ton of respect for him and how he carried himself. Uh, you know, Buddy Bell was probably uh, my favorite manager. Uh, I, I, you know, we're both big University of Kentucky fans, the Wildcat fans. Uh, so uh, we talked about that a lot. But he was fiery and, and competitive and, and, and same thing, that, you know, just like me. So we kind of hit it off. Uh, I like Bruce Bochy a lot. Um, he, he was, uh, when I played with him, played for him, it was right at the beginning of his managing career, but I could tell that he was, he was really good. He was always thinking ahead. And, um, so th- those are the guys that kind of stood out for me. That's pretty good. When you talk about pitching to Cal Ripken, that's like, wow. But anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, when you played at Detroit, who was your manager up there? <clears throat> well, I had a couple different ones buddy bell was my manager okay in, in 97 and then uh in 99 uh i think it was uh larry parish okay uh, okay so buddy i didn't bell. know yeah i didn't know if sparky anderson was around that time or not no he was um he was there maybe the year a couple years before that Okay. Uh, I, you know, he was there when uh, I was with Toronto and Cleveland. Um, but um, let me see who else. Oh, Phil Garner was there my last year. So. Okay, gotcha. Also, now I mean, you're still in the baseball. We're talking about what you're doing nowadays. Now you, uh, you're the pitching coach for the West West Michigan Whitecaps. Uh, do you still enjoy? being connected to the baseball and how much do you enjoy coaching compared to playing? I definitely love baseball. I mean, that's, uh, you know, when I first got done playing, uh, I ended up, you know, for the first couple of years, I was just kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. Ended up buying a business and uh, owned and operated my own business for uh, about six years. Um, but I always had the itch to get back into the, into baseball. And, and when I got a ch- chance to sell that, that business, um, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to uh, coach in pro ball. And, and really I, I love it. You know, I, you know, I feel like I have a lot to offer to those kids um, that I'm coaching. And um, I, I've had a lot of experience in the game. I, I've, I've been good. I've been bad. I've started. I've relieved. I've been released. I've been traded for. I've signed as a free agent. I mean, um, you know, I, I've pitched in every inning of, 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 of the game in every situation. So I feel like when I'm coaching these kids, whatever they're going through, I've gone through most of it. I, I, they can't really go through a situation I haven't been through. So I feel like I have a lot to offer them and I can help them get through uh, down times when they're, when they're, when they're feeling down or when they're lost a little confidence. If when they're feeling really good, I can, I can say, Hey man, you, you got to stay even keel. You got to keep working. You got to do this um, situations. I, I've been through a lot of situations in games and, and I can read hitters and I can do certain things. And I, so I, I love doing that. I love that part of the game. And, and um, um, so I, I really enjoy the coaching. I love playing, uh, you know, and, and, and it was tough to get that out of my system. But 
you know, as you get older, you start realizing you can't quite go out there and do some of those things. So I've, my, I, I use that competitive, you know, that coaching to, for my competitive uh, side now, you know, as, as a competitive outlet. So, um, I, you know, I, there's, there's nothing else I'd rather do. I, I love doing it. Um, and, and hopefully I can continue to do this for a while. You know, that's some, you know, great answers there. I mean, you've been a really great uh, interview tonight. Uh, very insightful. I loved your answers. Uh, you know, we've got uh, Mike Long. He says, great show, guys. Two Corn says, hello. And i got Richard Vingle here. He lives up around Lake Erie, and he played minor league baseball in 61. And uh, I know uh, uh, he had a question here, which he sent it on my, where I shared it on my uh, personal page. So I didn't see it here on my foundation page. But he says, he's a great guest, Dave. I am really enjoying Willie. Here's a question for Willie. Pitching coach who helped you the most? Ooh, pitching <laughs> coach that helped me. Um, Galen Cisco is probably um, the one one guy that really really helped me. Um, he I had him in Triple A when I, I actually got hurt in Triple A and I ended up missing two months. I I strained a ligament in my elbow, and but he was with me every day to work me through that. And when I started my throwing program. He didn't want anybody else throwing with me. He's like, I want to throw with him. So he was out there every day doing the rehab. Uh, he, he was kind of like a second father to me. Uh, taught me a lot about how to go about my business and, 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 and um, you know, in professional baseball. And fortunately for me, after that year in 89 in AAA, he became the pitching coach in the big leagues and the, for the next year or so I ended up playing for him in the big leagues the next year. And so we were very familiar with each other. And, and, uh, and like I said, he, he was like a second father to me and, and I learned a lot from him um, just about being a professional. And, and, and he, I, he was another guy that was a really tough competitor. He was all American linebacker at Ohio state. So that, that tells you what kind of competitor he was. Uh, but um, so him uh, another guy that uh, i feel like uh helped me a lot was a guy named rick adair who um i had him in in trip away with the indians and then i had him uh about six years later i had him in the big leagues with the tigers um and and he was a guy that uh um mechanically probably uh helped me probably more than anybody, but he also, he had an uncanny sense of um, being able to put together a game plan uh, for each individual pitcher. So he came, he could come up with game plans and how to face uh, hitters and, and, and to exploit their weaknesses with my strengths. Um, so he was really good at that. And, and he had a big, impact on my year in 97 there that's some good information there and uh the last question before we let you go uh what do you do like on your off season if you get time to do anything what do you enjoy doing well i've uh i've been a deer hunter turkey hunter for a long long time uh and that's what i normally uh do during off season um uh, the last several years have been tough for me though. Um, uh, the last three years, um, I've been in the Dominican Republic coaching winter ball. So I've not been able to hunt at all for the last three years. And then, uh, two or three years prior to that, uh, I had a one shoulder surgery that I couldn't hunt it. I couldn't hunt that year. Uh, and then the, another year I had uh, knee surgery. So I, I could hunt a little bit, but I, I couldn't hunt as much as, as normal. So I guess, you know, five out of the last six years, I haven't gotten to hunt much at all. So, um, but anyway, that, that's what I love to, you know, and I used to love fishing, and, but uh, now it's more about, you know, spending time with my family as much as I can. I don't, 
don't get to spend a whole lot of time with them during the season at all. And, and um, you know, just being able to see my kid, my wife and kids, basically. Exactly. And, uh, you know, you've got my number, so you know how to get in touch with me when it comes to hunting, fishing and everything else. Uh, you know, uh, uh, yes, sir. Scott Ratliff said my brother name brother's name was Rex. So they grew up together and went to Johnson Central together. So if that okay. helps, you know. sir, I remember Rex for sure, and I now I remember him. There you so. go. That that helped us out there a little bit. Uh, next week, uh, if you're bored, uh, Willie, you can watch us uh, Monday night. We've got uh, Ryan Lemon on KSR Radio. Uh, Tuesday, we got uh, uh, Tim Martin on the uh, Boston Red Sox. Uh, professional scout, uh, Brandon Berger, that played for Kansas City Royals. We have him on Wednesday and Friday. We have Ed Hearn from the 86 New York Mets World Series team. So if you're okay. missing baseball, stay tuned. You can watch us on here. Sounds good. I, I probably will. I probably will for sure. I've certainly enjoyed talking to you and uh, uh, getting to know you a little bit over the last couple of days. Um, and, and believe me, if you're – if that's a true invitation, I'm probably going to hit you up on it. So it's a uh, true invitation. It's a true one. All you have to do is holler at me, and and we'll try to keep Joey Gillum away. I know I'm surprised Joey hasn't mentioned anything up here tonight, but uh, we'll have to hide from Joey. Uh, all jokes aside, Joey's a good guy, and I know y'all went to school together. So hopefully, we can get Joey up here when you come up or something and have a little reunion. That'd be awesome. I'd love to see Joey again. I we were buddies in college. And, uh, had some good memories there and, and, and I'd love to see him for sure. Sounds like a winner. And I really do appreciate you coming on tonight. Great answers. Very insightful. Appreciate everything you've done for us. Hopefully this also spreads the outreach about the foundation, what we're doing, spinal cord injury research and uh, scholarships. And we surely do really do appreciate you being on the show tonight. Well, I appreciate you having me. I really, I enjoyed it. And uh, anytime for sure. All right. Thanks Willie. And we'll be in touch. I appreciate it. All right, buddy. Take care.